Welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye, where I get to talk in depth with some of the most interesting contemporary photographers working today about their latest projects. I'm David Oresik, the Executive Director of Silver Eye Center for Photography. Silver Eye works to promote the power of contemporary photography as a fine art medium by creating original exhibitions, unique educational programming like this series, and through the lab at Silver Eye, a production space for artists to learn, create, and connect. This week, I spoke with Chicago-based photographer and artist Jessica Labatt about her latest body of work, Almanac for Shade Gardeners. Labatt's photographic work has been exhibited widely in museums and galleries, including the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg, Florida, and at Higher Pictures in New York City. She currently is an assistant professor of photography at Northern Illinois University. In this conversation, we discuss her recent exhibition at Western Exhibitions in Chicago. This conversation was really fun for me. We got to go deep on how motherhood and other life changes have affected her work and how she came to terms with beauty, nostalgia, and sentimentality. I was especially interested to talk about how she brought elements of her own life and history into these new still lives and what that gesture has meant to her. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Jessica Labatt, uh, welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye. The first question I wanted to ask you about this work, and I've known you for a couple of years and I've known your work for longer than I've known you. And when you started making this work and you showed it to me, I was like, oh, these are floral still lives. These are like really <laughs> traditional <laughs> pictures of flowers in the studio. And I was, you know, the work I, had, I knew the most from yours and the work we had showed at Silver Eye a few years back was very abstract, painterly. Um, and this seemed like uh, you had gone to a direction that, that at least on the surface felt really traditional. So how did you, how did you wind up here? You know, I've always considered all of my work still life. So even the abstract works, I thought of them as if they were still lives. And um, when I was in grad school, I was making a lot of still life work. So that led me to still life um, in the first place. And then I kind of went down um, this path to abstraction from the still lives, like thinking about how you could arrange things in the studio and how they might have um, kind of shifting forms or look flattened out in space. And so, you know, choosing objects that did that took me to abstraction. But I came back to these like more like, you know, very classical still lifes because we had moved out of Chicago and I found my artistic practice very disrupted um, in the suburbs. Um, we had this house um, and I didn't have kind of access to the resources I was used to um, for collecting or finding things. And I thought about some advice that I give to my students where I like ask them to think about what they have access to, what resources they might have in abundance or something that they have unique access to that somebody else might not have. And we had this garden um, that my husband and I had been cultivating that had also been planted by the people who lived here before us. And so there was this, you know, kind of abundance of flowers and plants um, accessible to me. And so I used that same process of finding and collecting the flowers to make these still lifes. I know they look very kind of traditional and classical. And um, I was worried about that at first, you know, like who, who wants to make pictures of flowers? If <laughs> my students did that, I'd be like, oh my God, please photograph something else, you know. But I think I found a way to use the flowers to mean much more than just their pictures of flowers. Well, there's one part of your life that was also disrupted, right, with the move to the suburbs or, or disrupted or changed, which was you became a mother. And you, you talked a lot about motherhood influencing this body of work. You know, when, I, when we moved to the suburbs, um, we had this radical shifting in a lot of different parts of our lives. Um, we became parents. Um, we moved to the suburbs. I became a full-time teacher at, on a tenure track job. And then we had a kid and all of these different um, roles that I was expected to take on started to pull me in directions um, where I was caring for others or um, 
my priorities as an individual and artist um, were maybe less important or you know taking second place and I felt like I my whole ide identity had to shift and I had to kind of reevaluate who I was as an artist and a woman and a person an individual in the world to incorporate the space for all these other people and it was really weird too becoming a parent you know like all there are all these things that these cliches about like oh your heart you've never known love until you have kids or your heart will expand in these ways that you didn't know it could feel and all these cliches that were suddenly true and I was like living these cliches um, and in some way making photographs of flowers felt really cliche too so there was this kind of parallel of like the cliches I was living as a mother parent and the cliche of making photographs of flowers like how could you use both of those sources to make something interesting well, you know, I, I mean, and I also recently became a parent. So I was, I was thinking about that a lot while I was kind of looking through these photographs. And um, I think there is something about parenthood for me that has allowed me to sort of embrace the loveliness of a cliche. Maybe the, the other element to them that I think, um, if you could explain a little bit, there's, there's a number of objects in addition to flowers in these pictures. So what, what, are, what else? What else are we looking at in these in these images? So there's the flowers and um, the other objects in the pictures. They're all things that I have collected um, from my house. Um, I have a studio at my home. Our studio, my studio is in the basement. Um, so I kind of work in close proximity to the, the domestic space and. Um, when my my child was really little, I found it really hard to be that close to the studio, but also it felt so far away. Um, and I didn't have these long hours to go down there and work like I used to. Um, and I felt a lot of anxiety and pressure about that, um, you know, because I'm an artist and I should be constantly making work. Um, and so I found that one of the ways that I was able to stay present and active with my child while I was caring for him was to start collecting little objects throughout the day that I found really beautiful or interesting. Um, they could be things that he was engaged with or something that we were playing with. Sometimes they were things I took away from him because they were dangerous or things <laughs> that just like caught my eye that day um, and became a point of focus. Um, I was trying to be like, incorporating more mindfulness activities and being really present in the moment. And so I would, you know, focus a lot of attention on these little bits of, um, I don't know, pieces of paper or toys or um, decorations from a birthday party, jewelry, hmm. all kinds of things that were just around the house. Is there like a, a particular photo you could talk <laughs> about that has kind of a object that that is maybe more resonant or, or you could just kind of expand on a little bit? Sure. Um, this picture, Sippy, has um, in it these little flowers that are called fairy wings. Um, and I love that name for them. But they also have um, a dandelion. And the dandelion my son picked as we were walking through the garden. <clears throat> and when he picked it, he realized that the stem of the dandelion was hollow and so it was like a straw and so he was putting it in his mouth and like pretending like he was sucking out of it and then i was thinking about like sippy cups and looking for a tiny little vase um, that i could put a flower in and found this little cordial glass that i had stolen from a restaurant um, <laughs> when i was in my 20s in the city and had been drinking too much and um, so it was like this perfect place for that little flower to sit. And then there's this um, piece of fluorite. So it was part of my rock collection. So like this picture has things that mark my previous life as like a young wild free artist, bohemian in the city, this uh, symbol of my parenthood and caretaking for my child and exploring the world together. And then um, this little rock that you know was part of my larger rock collection. I, I love that ex explanation so much. And I think that kind of, I think you just put the, put your finger on something in this project that I've been trying to sort of articulate, which is 
they have a they have a kind of autobiographical quality to them that is really profound and you know just just in the sense that the kind of like the cordial glass and the kind of wild partying 20s days kind of coexist so elegantly with the parenting sippy cup straw like do you did you think of the work as being autobiographical like that while you were making it or is that something that kind of occurred to you later well I've never made work that is autobiographical I have actually tried to never make work that's personal or engaged with my own life um and after I became a parent I realized that there was so much about our society where um there was inequality for women or mothers in the workplace or um it really made me question my role as a as a feminist artist and some of these boundaries of like personal and um professional started to disintegrate you know as the mm -hmm. boundaries just were more permeable um and so it was kind of inescapable that some of my personal life would come into the work and at first i was really scared about that because it seemed i don't know sentimental or unintelligent or um i don't know all, all negative Mm -hmm. But I realized that maybe that was something that we're missing in our world is the the human quality, the kind of personal or emotional experience, um, and that we need to kind of balance out the overly intellectual side of our creative mm -hmm. practice, or I needed to, and let a little more of the humanity come in. In Pink Champagne, let's say, that is a photograph of a clematis flower that is called a pink champagne clematis because the color is kind of the same as pink champagne. But for me, pink champagne was my spirit drink. And Eric and I would take um, pink champagne and pizza to the beach and watch the sunset. And we'd watch the sunset on this quilt. And we had this really magical day where we found those rocks that are called story stones. And um, so it kind of hit a bunch of different um, meaning and emotional and uh, metaphorical resonance mm -hmm. and you could access those at different points you know maybe the audience would just look at it like a classical still life but there would also be this deeper meaning and that was okay to have there too i think that's again it's such a to me it's such an interesting and profound way to make a picture and i think one of the things that I really loved about the catalog for this exhibition um, was this conversation that, that opens the opens the catalog, a conversation between you and your husband, Eric May, who's also an artist and, and runs an arts organization and, and um, kind of seems to be a conversation where the two of you are walking around this garden where these flowers were, were grown. Um, and I, I believe at some point he sort of asks you like, I know this, he says something to the effect of like, I know the story behind all of these photographs. I know your life and I know kind of like what these objects mean and represent, but like, do you think anyone else will? I don't know, what, how did, how did you kind of understand that, understand that question or how did you take that? The garden walks were something we started to do um, after, well, we'd done them for a long time before we had a kid, but we'd um, go on a walk through the garden, um, to look at the flowers and they became these moments where we would really reflect on our day and you know talk about what's happening in the garden and kind of plan for the future and anticipate what's going to bloom next um, and so they became these important markers in time for us and then after we had a kid it was like the first moment that you'd be away from the kid they're safely in bed and we could kind of have some space as adults together and when we were talking about some of those things, like what is the meaning of these objects and what if people can't access them? Um, I don't know, like, it, I think that that is, that's a problem that all artists have, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you're always drawing from your personal experience of the world, whether you're acknowledging it or not. And some artists are more, overt in how their work you know relates to their biography and some like to hide it more mm -hmm. um 
And I, I really felt like it was okay to let some of that in because it really started to speak for a, mo a more holistic way of being a human and an artist in the world. And it wasn't, it let some of the messiness in. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't like I was, you know, just this artist, this, some fictional artist that had this studio and tons of assistants. It was like, yeah, sometimes this spilled paper towel is so beautiful. I'm going to take it downstairs and put it in one of my photographs. <laughs> but it was really cleaning up a mess. Well, and I, I think that's one of the things I love about photography too, is it can sort of suggest and entice without revealing everything you know like I think many of these photographs when I first looked at them before I really read anything about them or had a chance to talk to you about them I would you could obviously tell they were the objects from a home or they were the kind of parts of a life and some of them were kind of some of them will resonate with parents right like missing puzzle pieces and stuff like that that are just kind of um, part of the act of parenting there's one with a like a iPod headphone that's um, seems to be somewhat taped together and you know it, it shows a little bit of its like existence on it in a way that you know to me one of the things I love about art is that you can have a a beautiful object or an enticing object and you it also presents you with the fact to a, a way to dig deeper and engage deeper with the work if you want to, you know, um, read about it or ask the artist or, or kind of uh, kind of go kind of go there. And I, I love this work because it it asks you to go there, but you don't, you know, it asks you to dig deeper, but you don't necessarily need to to understand, to appreciate it, or to enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. And um, that makes me think about um, <clears throat> when I was making this work, I had found this article. Um, or this short essay written by Abel Hooks, mm -hmm. and um, it's called Beauty Laid Bare, Aesthetics in the Ordinary. And it talked about how we as a society need to have more beauty in our lives. That felt so empowering to me um, because that was kind of reinforcing this change in attention that I was already doing, where I was starting to try to find beauty in the little fragments of our daily life. Um, and thinking about it as being maybe like a radical gesture or a political gesture. Um, Do you think before this you were ambivalent about kind of embracing beauty full on? Well, I don't think I would have ever used the word beauty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I would have been like aesthetics or <laughs> formal compositions or something because beauty just seemed, I don't know, like vapid or... <laughs> like, <laughs> Which is so weird, right? Like, <laughs> it's supposed to be one of the noblest things, beauty, but... Um, beauty is truth. Yeah, right? Um, I, I don't think I was allowing... Even though I felt like my work always kind of explored either my attraction to objects or um, kind of formal color relationships in works that might be considered beautiful mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't allow that word in <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I, I I think one reason that's interesting to me is because I feel very similar to you in my kind of art practice and curating practices you know maybe the past 10 years sort of being more open to beauty as a word and a concept and the and a sort of a thing that's good enough on its own. And and then one thing I started noticing, especially again, going back to the 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 Shade Garden, which is the title of the catalog, um, the conversation you had with Eric, where he talks about the the sort of melancholy of the cut flower, right? Where it's, you know, you're you're kind of destroying the thing to to make the beautiful photograph of it. And it was something, you know, there's two photographs, um, where the flowers are are sort of wilted. Um, there's this one, which I, I don't know if that is a title. It's called Untitled Here, um, where where they sort of take on a more kind of memento mori, perhaps, 
vibe was that did that factor into your thinking about using the studio or, or using cut flowers I in making this work I really could only make this work when my child was asleep so <clears throat> I had nap times and night times to work it was also really interesting making this work because um, I had to photograph the flowers as they bloomed so there was this kind of natural cycle of growth where some flowers would bloom and then you know they would peak and die and so I had to capture those flowers as they were blooming and so I had to kind of turn myself over to the flowers and be accountable to their schedule mm -hmm. and depending on whatever was happening with my life that might not be the best time to make a picture so there was this kind of time pressure where once the flower was cut, I had to go to the studio that day. I had to carve out that time. And so, you know, if nap time didn't happen, I might have to rely on my husband to help give me the space to go to the studio, or I'd have to go after, you know, our, our child was asleep and work late into the night um, because some of the flowers you couldn't cut again. They might be, you know, near peaking and then they wouldn't be there again until the next year. So yeah, the time pressure was definitely a part of my my thinking and the fleetingness of them. And and then, you know, some of the dried flowers, those I didn't get to in time. <laughs> and <laughs> they dried up and yeah. <clears throat> they looked still so beautiful, especially daffodils. Man, when daffodils dry out, they're the most beautiful, transparent, like tissue paper texture. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't had them kind of waiting to be photographed. Yeah, I love the idea that there's a natural rhythm with this project, right? That you're on, you know, that this is kind of a kind of a calendar, kind of has has some marker of time built in. Um, I also love the title, and I was wondering if you could talk about the title of this series is called Almanac for Shade Gardeners. Yeah, well, you hit on a, a it's totally a calendar, um, and that's how I was thinking about it. Um, the title Almanac for Shade Gardeners came um, because, you know, as a new parent, I was reading lots of parenting books. Mm. Um, and then those talk a lot about these different stages or cycles or developmental stages. And um, so there was a different way of thinking about time for me. You know, at first there's the timing of like every two hours, this baby needs to be fed. And then there's the weeks and months. And so I was really thinking about time differently than I really ever had. You know, we're look, we're, we, were, we were trying to learn about how our garden would unfold and when was the best time to plant things. And we have this shade garden. So our, our lot is very shaded, it's forested. So we have part, part shade to shade in most parts of our yard. So we had to do a lot of research about what kind of plants would grow here. And so we found ourselves looking at such things as almanacs or gardening handbooks. Um, mm. And why I really liked almanacs were almanacs were these collections of all kinds of information. There would be like folk wisdom or words, words of <laughs> advice and um, calendars for planting. And some would have horoscopes or moon cycles. And um, I don't know, it was just this really beautiful collection of information and felt inspiring, like those are the kinds of sources I was pulling from, all these varied um, sources for my work. Hmm. So it felt like I was trying to generate an almanac for other people who were young artist mothers or other people who might have shade gardens. So. Well, well, the idea that, um, that there's a kind of like almanac-like bit of wisdom in the photographs, I mean, I think that sort of goes to all those other ideas you're talking about, about the autobiographical nature and the stories contained in the kind of um, calendar, the bits of timing contained with all the, with the photographs that kind of all add up. And, but of course it's still a photograph, right? So it's not accessible in the way, you know, an almanac entry would be where you would just read it through, but it's, it's kind of um, more, more of a feeling of, of a kind of almanac entry. Do you mind, um, you know, talking about another specific photograph or two? I love the I love the kind of stories behind them. Is there one or two more? Sure. Can... This picture has a lot of different elements that I think are really symbolic. Um, so the the cloth, that kind of elaborate piece of fabric that looks like a rug, um, 
that's the thing that was on my parents' dresser when I was a kid. And I always thought it was so luxurious and beautiful. <laughs> and so I brought it with me to Chicago when I moved to art school <laughs> and have had it for 20 years. And um, I don't know. So that's the basis of that. And then in the um, on top of it, on the left, there is a pyrite sun. And pyrite suns, that one's actually my husband's from his rock collection. Um, when we got married, we got to merge our rock collection. So that was pretty fun. <laughs> but pyrite suns only form in certain parts of the world. And that place is Illinois. So there's this you know, nod to this place where I live. Um, and then behind that, there's a mirror. And it's uh, a mirror that is um, two-sided. So one side is magnified and one side's not. And it's reflecting um, one of my spotting pieces that was hanging on the wall in my studio. And for me, that kind of acknowledges a lot of work that I made um, before all this, before yes. becoming a mother. Spot, spotting used... was one of your previous series. Yeah. And so those pictures kind of relate to this work because I was thinking a lot about like unseen labor with those pictures. Um, with these works, I was thinking about the unseen labor of mothers and parents and gardeners and um, so having that little nod to spotting there was interesting. And I also had done a lot of work with mirrors where I had mirrors reflecting space outside the camera's viewpoint into the camera frame. So that kind of acknowledges those other times of my studio practice. And then you have the hyacinth bulb and a little iris from our wild iris garden. The hyacinth bulb has these roots that are, you know, kind of circling around the base of the vase. When I was making this picture, there was this spider that was <clears throat> living outside our kitchen window. And every night the spider would come and make this elaborate web. And in the morning, the web would be gone. And then the next night she would come back and she would make this web again. And I just knew it was a woman spider or female spider. <laughs> She had this huge abdomen. It was just gigantic, like a, you know, a swollen pregnant belly. And she would just spin this most elaborate web. And she was huge. She was the biggest spider I'd ever seen. And she was performing this you know, elaborate act of weaving in the night um, in the light from our, over our kitchen sink. And I just thought that was so beautiful that she was making this you know, elaborate weaving for, to catch food care for herself um, and then in the morning it was gone and there was such a resonance with my own practice that I was going to the studio at night making these pictures and then in the morning the flowers would be dead and then also I was doing a lot of research about art history and thinking about Carolee Schneeman's interior scrolls and how that was similar to the spider that you know Carolee Schneeman's reading this um, scroll that she's pulling out of her vagina and here's the spider pulling these threads out of her abdomen. And there was just kind of a, a similarity between those. So this piece is called Orb Weaver slash Interior Scrolls. God, I, I mean, I just, I just love the <clears throat> density that you pack this image full of like references and stories and um, things from your life and your childhood and your marriage and your life as an artist. And I think, um, one of the things that's really moving to me is the way you're embracing not separating those parts of your life, the way there's kind of like just one kind of complete person in in your studio practice now. That's so interesting because like I remember being in my 20s and being like now I'm going to be the artist you know and like you would feel like you were performing this role and um I don't feel that way now. <laughs> or, you know, even to go back to that question, I know, you know, again, this is something that you and Eric talk about in the catalog conversation where you have the <clears throat> the rock from your husband's rock collection. I mean, and maybe this is just the same question as embracing beauty, but do you think um, bringing sentimentality into these images, was that hard for you? Or did you feel like, you know, you, you sort of talked about maybe sentimentality being a, a bad word. Yeah. Well, I think it is in our society, right? Like, oh, it's sentimental. Like, oh, that's not intelligent or that's, you know, feminine or, you know, like all 
it's very derogatory to call something sentimental. Um, if I was to call something sentimental in an art critique, I think that would be a total insult. You know? <laughs> like, and so I think I definitely resisted it. I read this book, um, it's called The End of Men. It's by Hannah Rosen. It talked about how after the recession, a lot of the jobs that were, um, where men lost their jobs, women started to take over those um, positions when new positions opened up again. And the workforce was shifting to have a lot more women because women had these like soft skills and emotional intelligence and things like that. And it made me start to think about how those are things that we see as like not being intelligent or not being skillful or I don't know. Yeah. Not intelligent. And I wanted to kind of fight for those forms of intelligence that are maybe more intuitive or more emotional but sentimentality culturally is seen as, you know, such a negative thing that, yeah, it was hard to kind of balance that like cultural association, but then my, also my desire for a more holistic, you know, well-rounded emotional experience of the world. You know, when you say that it's sort of frowned on in the culture, I think maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're might be saying like it's sort of frowned on in a kind of certain certain school of intellectual art world discourse, right? Like obviously yes. the culture at large still <laughs> loves still loves and enjoys flowers. But I think kind of changing I see this as um part of a project that I'm really interested in that many artists I think are working on, which is about changing that discourse to be more welcoming to things like parenthood, uh you know, just like more welcoming to, to more kinds of people who who didn't respond to the way that beauty and sentiment was shut out of kinds of discourses. Um, I don't know. I mean, I keep, I, I kind of want to call that a feminist kind of response to it, but I'm not sure if that's right. Do you think that's part of a feminist response? Well, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. The feminist thing is super complicated, right? Like, <clears throat> when I started making this work, I felt like I was trying to make work from a more feminist point of view, but I wanted to make feminist work that wasn't about the body or using bodies or, um, mm -hmm. you know, where women were being photographed. And I did a lot of research about feminism and, um, you know, kind of the 1970s feminism and was really kind of troubled because I was looking for role models or mentors who navigated the space of an artist as an intellectual space and a creative space, but also navigated the space of motherhood. And, you know, I found a lot of writing about Judy Chicago and how, you know, she's this champion of feminist thought and um, has made some super amazing, inspiring work. Um, but a lot of her students would talk about how she was really down on motherhood and didn't want her students to have children. And I think at the time, right, like women were trying to get out of the house and assert mm -hmm. their in independent space in the working world. And so you had to kind of reject motherhood and domestic space and all those things in order to fight for your rights as a human and individual in the world. And, um, you know, I, I am deeply influenced by the canon of art history as taught to us in art schools. Um, I didn't learn from any, um, you know, none of my professors had, were mothers, you know, mm. there were women for sure who were amazing, you know, feminists, but none of them had children. Um, so I didn't have those <laughs> role <laughs> models to look to. You know, if, if there's something about the work that really comes through to me and I think comes through that much clearer through this conversation is is the way you can kind of, you know, like the word I want to use is joyful. Like it kind of is joyfully reconciling all of these uh, complex uh, emotions. And I think a lot of them are like happy memories, right? Like a lot of these objects are sort of signifying like, a lot of evidence of kind of a life well lived in different stages. And a lot of them are kind of grappling with um, the 
the things I don't know I mean would you say like is it too much to say like the things you're kind of unlearning from the art the traditional art education or the art canon and um kind of starting to forge your own path Ooh, I love that if if only I could feel like I am really forging my own path I love that um yeah I mean sure totally I am trying to I mean I'm super grateful for my education in the art world like I would not be who I am without that and I think that there is more than I was taught and I think we all have to find our own path as artists and um, I, I feel like this is probably the work I feel the most proud of because it does feel the most like truthful to my experience in the world. And um, I felt the most vulnerable making it and it felt really risky. And um, so maybe that is, you know, forging your own path because there's that, that fear or scare, scariness about where you're going or if this is okay or right because you don't have you know, someone guiding you, you're kind of on your own path. Hmm. Well, I think that's, that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, Jessica Labatt, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right.